Hi, this is Steve at HeavenlySign2017.com. I hope that you all had a very Merry Christmas. Just to recap where that we have come so far in this study through Ephesians, that we're looking at the mind of the Holy Spirit, not Paul, that God has called us saints, that He's called us faithful in Christ Jesus, that we are greeted with the words grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, elected by divine decree, chosen in Him before the foundation of the world, adopted into the family and the household of God as sons, redeemed through the precious blood of Christ, that Christ became our kinsman redeemer, having died in our place, and that God has gathered together into one all things in Christ, that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, given an inheritance, given a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, ourselves being his inheritance, that we've been quickened to life in Christ and raised with him, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, and this entire process being the gift of God, given solely on the basis of His desire and His good and perfect will, not according to anything that we have done, but because of His great love, which He has for us, where that we have been reconciled unto God, restored to a former position, Christ having annulled that enmity which stood between us and God through the blood of his cross, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, he himself being the very fulfillment of the law which he himself gave, to create in himself one new man, thereby making peace, where the God has nothing whatsoever against us and how that we are said to be his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that, and that it is these good works of Christ which God hath prepare, uh, prepared beforehand or before ordained in which we are to walk in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord in whom we also are being built by God into a habitation of God in the Spirit. But sadly, this is not what most Christians today believe. Rather, they, and I've got, I put it, I'm putting up here on the screen what I, I think is worth consideration. It's more of I wish, I wish I was a saint. I wish I was faithful, I wish I had God's grace, and I wish I had peace. I wish God would bless me. I wish I felt secure. I, I chose God, and I hope God loves me, and we still have to keep the law. I hope I go to heaven and, and more. The problem is not with what God hasn't done or with what the Christian has failed to do, but a refusal to believe God that what he has said is true. That's what it all narrows down to, folks. If you have been a Christian for one day, one day, you have to admit that the majority of Christians today live in an entirely different universe, an entirely different realm than what we're seeing in this epistle inspired by God through the Apostle Paul. Christians who view security as well as maturity as something to be grasped through self-effort when nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. The word boldness there, um, paresia, means freedom, confidence, especially in speech. 
before the public in view of all. That's literally freedom of speech. Access, the word there for access means admission, to come towards, to come near, uh, to come near with intimate face-to-face -face interaction. It's where you're not afraid to come face-to-face -face with someone and speak your mind freely with the assurance that God is favorably, favorably disposed toward us. The word confidence, meaning to be fully persuaded. It's from the word pytho. It has pytho as its root, uh, meaning they're a feminine noun derived from pytho to persuade or be persuaded. Properly persuasion, it's used of human confidence. It's also, it's used in the, you see it in the negative sense, but more commonly it's used to denote spirit produced persuasion through the faith in him. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. I desire, I desire is a very strong word. It means to beg to, or to demand, uh, faint meaning to grow weary or weak or to fail in heart. Now I want you to note what God does not say here. He doesn't say my tribulations for you that lead to your glory. Paul says, my tribulations for you, which is your glory. He actually equates the two as being one and the same. The word glory, doxa in the Greek, is a word that means uh, what evokes a good opinion, uh, that something has an intrinsic worth or value. There was no way that the Ephesians could have known what their value was to God unless Paul suffered for their sake. Just as there's no way that we could know what our value is to God unless Christ suffered for our sake. And neither could they realize their value or their worth, what they were worth to God, except through the hardships that Paul encountered. We're not to grow weary over that which is working for our ultimate good. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word knees there is plural. It's both knees. Both knees. So why does Paul say Father of and not just our Lord Jesus Christ? And why is Paul bowing both knees unto the Father while in the most difficult circumstances or state of tribulation that he's presently in? Well, let's go on of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now that word for family is the word father in the Greek. Lineage, ancestor, ancestry, tribe, those who lay claim to a common origin. The grammar suggests out and away from the one of whom the name is derived. I believe God intends that we understand that the believers the saints' common ancestry links back to the Father. Running back to our Heavenly Father as being the progenitor. And Ancestry.com seeks to provide insight into this as far as our earthly lineage is concerned. God has adopted us as sons, His sons, all being traced back to a single Father the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the emphasis being on the phrase, the whole family, the family of God. We are family. We are family, related by adoption, whether on earth or in heaven. It's not a potential father, like a hopeful father, like I hope he's my father, or we are members of God's household that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's not the flesh. That's the inner man. There's no strength in the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. The phrase he would grant you is in the subjunctive mood of uncertainty. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. We're not looking at the indicative mood of certainty here. The word strengthened 
followed by the word dia, through, through the spirit of him in the inner man. That is the power of God that prevails over any and all opposition, that, that gains mastery, that gains the upper hand, as one would say. Now that is Paul's prayer for them while under great duress, under great tribulation. Uh, Paul was suffering tribulation, trial, hardship. Now, if that was most of us, I'm not sure we wouldn't be praying for deliverance from the hardship that we were suffering. Yet we don't see Paul doing that. Paul's concern was for them. I want you to let that really, I, I, I hope to really drive home that point. I find it hard not to suggest that Paul certainly had to have been strengthened with might through God's spirit in his, in his inner man to be able to pray that his hearers would become the same. It, that's what it takes. Strengthened with might through God's spirit in their inner man and that to beseech God for one's own deliverance from such hardship is really, it's, it's a response originating from the flesh. I just want out of this. God, I don't want to go through this. You don't see the benefit of it, not for yourself or for, other, for anyone else. The, it would not be a new man response. Yet, I suggest that that's what many a Christian today would want. And it's, it's one thing to say, and rightly so, that we grow stronger through trials. Most believers understand that. That we benefit by them, that we derive benefit through those trials. That we grow stronger as a result of them. It's an entirely no, uh, another thing to realize the fact that, that they are never given nor intended just solely for us to be the sole benefactor of those trials. But that God views such tribulations as that which is for the sake of other members of the body. I don't see how we can come away from the words of this text believing anything else. And that is a tremendous, tremendous truth. That, that's a truth that should grip the very heart and soul of every one of us. And moreover, the emphasis is on our being strengthened with might by God's Spirit in the inner man as opposed to the outward man or the flesh it's the working is taking place on the inside not the outside in what god is doing not what we do for god may be able may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height well, fully able is the word there, perfectly able to have strength for the task, aggressive strength at work, getting past the knowledge gaps, laying hold of, and again, it's a subjunctive, that you might be fully able to comprehend. That is to seize tight hold of, to catch, to capture, to appropriate, to aggressively take or seize that's, that's the word that we're looking at. Those words breadth, length, and height pretty much encompass it all. That's the very fullness of Christ which surfaces in the next verse. And, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I can see that the word love there is agape. That's God's love, that which originates from God. The surpassing knowledge, that's, that's gnosko, that's experiential knowledge. The word is not, it is not oida, perfect knowledge, but gnosko, but that which is realized or known through experience. That you might be filled, again, that's, there's, that's a subjunctive, the mood of uncertainty. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. That you might be filled with the fullness of God literally into all the fullness of God, or uh, abundance, we might say. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, 
according to the power that works in us. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems most obvious to me that God's desire for us that we are seeing expressed here through Paul is a far cry from what most believers today believe is God's desire for them, as well as what our desire should be for one another in the body of Christ. And that God's sole interest, his, his whole interest, is in that which pertains to the inner man, not the outward man, not the flesh. And that our focus is to be on Christ, not ourselves. That these desires of God are laid hold of by faith, which produce the righteousness of God. It's faith's righteousness, being rooted and grounded in love, that being God's love for us. That God is completely capable, whereas we are not. That our strength comes through Him and not of ourselves. Or that we have boldness and access to Him through faith in the perfect, finished work of Christ. Now, if you believe, if you believe that this is what you are being taught today, from most modern pulpits, then you have been, well, you've been genuinely blessed. But if we're to be honest with ourselves and God, we have to admit that this is not what is commonly taught or believed today among most Christians who profess to know Jesus Christ as their life. We are here looking at Paul's desire expressed through the Holy Spirit toward his people, Christians, not non-believers. This is God's love letter to you. Not just this epistle, but the entire Word of God is His love letter to you. So how, how do you read Scripture? Do you read the Word of God as if it were just some instruction book on how to live the Christian life? Just, you know, like it was some computer manual. Or have you come to realize in the spirit of grace that God has given you that it is in fact the revelation of the person and the work of Christ on your behalf? There's only one reason why Christians today are so unconcerned with what we are learning from the text here. One reason why videos like this get so few views as little views as they do. And that is because Christians today are too busy trying to serve God in the flesh. That's perhaps all they've ever known. They don't know anything else. To them, the, they, you know, they just skim across the surface. To them, the Christian life has never been anything but striving to put their best foot forward. So that God, maybe God will be pleased with them. Or in the worst case, that they will somehow earn God's acceptance or earn heaven. When the truth is, is that they have been accepted in the beloved. And that the life we live is not I, but Christ. God's desire that we see expressed here through Paul for these members of God's family is my desire, my prayer for you all as well. Paul said in Philippians 3.10 that I may know him. Folks, the one reason for our existence as believers is to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and it, it's through this knowledge that we know our Heavenly Father. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, 3. This is to be personal oneness of nature knowledge, not just knowledge about God. Entering into this wonderful fellowship of union with him is going to require 
the best of our attention here and all of it in eternity. The key to knowing the Lord Jesus here and now is the Word of God. We can learn about Him through our general study of the Scriptures, but we can only get to know Him personally by feeding on Him, not some list of instructions on as to what we ought to do or not do. And while we feed on Christ as the bread of life and we abide in Him as the true vine, then the Holy Spirit is forming Christ deep within the springs of our life, within our very spirit, which is where He abides. When we gaze on Him in the Word, we look at the Word, and we don't just look at it as a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life, but we look at it, we're gazing on the Lord Jesus as our life, the foundation of all resurrection life is death folks it's death if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection said Paul in Romans chapter 6 but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us has quickened us together with Christ and has raised us up together. We are new creations in Christ by the power of His resurrection. We count ourselves alive to God in Christ. Through our faith in this fact, the Holy Spirit makes the truth real in our condition, our growth. We abide in Him above, and He manifests Himself to us below. Suffering is the, the lot of all men. It's the privilege of all believers. The general thinking is that God is not blessing us unless He keeps us from or, or He relieves us from our suffering. Far from it. There is no fellowship with and growth in the crucified Lord without suffering, physical, mental, and spiritual. Fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ is the source of our suffering. If when you do well and you suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, 1 Peter 2.20, 20, 2.21. Paul is our pattern of suffering as a Christian. As soon as the Apostle Paul was saved, the Lord said, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, 2 Corinthians 4.11. Paul's sufferings came indirectly from the nail-pierced hands and the spear-pierced heart of his Lord. And all these things were working together for his good. Notice Paul's attitude. I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's through suffering that we learn something of the process of growth. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience. Romans 5 3 and as we remain within the crucifying influence of the cross dead to sin but alive unto God we are free to abide in the life-giving influence of the, the one who's raised the resurrected one Jesus Christ 
in whom we have been raised. We are to be conformed to his death as the basis of our being conformed to the image of his life out of death. In this world that we live in here, folks, we are as pilgrims, crucified followers of our crucified Lord. Jesus said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, there's only one reason why Christians today are so unconcerned with what we're learning here from the text, and that is because they are too busy trying to avoid the cross of Christ which crucifies, trying to serve God in the flesh when we have been crucified with Christ. They don't know anything about life out of death because they haven't experienced that death. They haven't come to the end of themselves. When, when I'm reading through this epistle, I see in every, every jot and tittle of what I'm looking at is the focus is on anything but the flesh being alive and profitable in some sense as far as our walk and our service in Christ. They don't know anything else. They don't know the way of the cross. They, to them, the Christian life has never been anything but striving to, to keep the law so that God will be pleased with them. I, I've told people time and time again, I'll keep on saying it. We're putting the cart before the horse when we do that. You're not reading any of that here. What you're reading here, what you're learning here, what you're seeing in these, in these, in these verses in Ephesians is anything but that. You're seeing the reverse of what is commonly thought to be to the, the, the very Christian life. God is laying a foundation. He's, he's showing you what we have in Christ, our possessions that we have in Christ, our position in Him, how much we've been blessed, just the enormous amount of blessings that we've received in Christ. It is only based upon this that we then move forward, as we'll see in the following chapters. And our service is based upon who we are. Not, it's not based on some idea, some faulty erroneous idea of, well, if I can just do this or do that, then I will become this or that. That's what I've been trying to impress upon my listeners through these teachings through Ephesians. There's a foundation. We have to have these foundational facts in order to move forward and to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And before I just get off preaching, I think I'm going to let it go at this, but we have been accepted in the beloved, dearly beloved. God has nothing against you. You have been accepted in the beloved. And the, the, the life that we live is not I, but Christ. It's the righteousness of God that's based on faith. And God's desire that we see expressed here through Paul for these precious members of his household is is my desire as well my prayer for you all as well i thank you all for listening and i thank you for your love and your feedback your positive messages of encouragement i truly do until next time this is steve thanks for listening